did you get anything settled, Bill, about two weeks from now? Not yet. Not yet? Let's see where we went tonight. Okay. So what we'd like to do is uh, we'd like to review, and let's go back and look at these uh, flow diagrams and look at the... Now, wh what we're going to use these for is to try and understand what goes on during the, during the interaction of the protocol. And you'll notice what's missing here is the, the SABM and the UA that started this whole thing off in the, in the beginning. You can't just come to this point. But what they're trying to point out here is the fact that uh, the DTE side, which we'll call uh, KE0QA, and the DCE side, which we'll call uh, W6OAV, I sent Bill three continuous iframes and Bill acknowledged by sending a receiver ready saying that he's expecting number three next. Now I numbered mine zero, because remember this is an IBM protocol and IBM always wants to start everything out with zero, which is to them only logical, never made an awful lot of sense to me. But I sent frame zero, at least I numbered it, right? And then I sent frame one, and then I sent frame two, and Bill says, okay, I got, I, I received your zero, one, and two. All in sequence, everything is fine, the way he said that it says, I'm expecting your number three next. So, so then I send number three, and then Bill would probably send me a receiver ready four with the next received of four. Yes? What determines the spacing when he sends the receiver ready? Uh, this time he sent the receiver ready after three packets, and next time he's going to send... Well, first of all, okay, let me, let me explain that when I get started here, I got control of the line. What I had to do before I could get started was to wait for the line to be idle. And there's a random timer, it's a random number generator that randomly, that waits a random amount of time based on a parameter that's in the TNC. So we don't all start at the same time. So, um, so I waited this, I was a good citizen, I waited, I have my, uh, my parameters set the proper way so that I wait the, you know, the appropriate amount of time. And I didn't hear anything on the circuit, so I started sending, and these probably came out one right after the, the, the other. In other words, they came out with maybe just one flag between them, because I had three iframes I wanted to send. Remember, I'm a fast typer. Yeah, just boom, 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 right, one right after the other. Three information. Three information frames. And on this last one, I probably set the pull bit, or I'm, I'm sorry, the, the final bit uh, to a one, demanding a response, saying, that's all I got to send right now. I want you to respond to me. So then Bill waited his random amount of time and responded. What could have happened in between here is all kinds of other conversations, because remember, we're time sharing this frequency. What we're just showing is the interaction between these two stations. So there could have been other, yeah. There, there could have been other, other stuff go on too during that whole interaction. Yes? You said max frame, going along with his question. Is that your maximum number of frames? Yes. So you get enough knowledge in back? Yeah, you have to be able to accept seven. So you, you have to have enough memory to be able to take seven frames of 128 bytes. That's, that's part of the protocol. Max frame is for your transmit. Has nothing to do with your receive. You have to be able to accept seven frames frame set at say three. Yes. Does that not mean that if you just, as you type fast, as you say, <laughs> uh, when you fill up three frames, you may be typing the fourth, but it will send the three. Yes. And then start storing, let's say. Yeah. 
you're really not going to see this in a, in a keyboard to keyboard operation. What you see is, uh, when you see this kind of an operation, you see this uh, uh, more, more like a bulletin board. Or you'll notice the long message that comes out here when you connect to a node. Uh, connected to node WG0N-7, WN in, in parens, WG0N channel A, enter gateway, so on and so forth. So he puts this long message out. So that comes in more than one, more than one packet, more than one frame. That came in several frames. So maybe that wasn't that Dave was. Well, Dave isn't that quick of a typer, but his machine had that, you know, had that much stuff stored. What does happen from time to time if you um, if you're on HF and you type in a way and you send one packet, but you never get an acknowledgement from it, and you're typing away, and now you've got a second packet stored. So it's send packet one, and it'll, send, it'll follow right away and send packet two. And while all this is going on, you're typing the third packet. You wind up you know, having several packets uh, stored up. There may be short. But nonetheless, this could happen in a keyboard situation on HF or on a very busy VHF channel. Yes? Joe, if there's a mistake uh, received, you know, on, uh, we'll say, the third one there, do you have seen all three of them over? <coughs> uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about all those possibilities. We're going to talk about this one getting clobbered and this one being received and this one making it and this one getting clobbered and this one received. Yeah, we're going to talk about all those situations coming up next. So you're getting, you know, you're a, you're, you know, a good lead in, but we're going to get to it. Okay. Well, aside, the, the relationship between an information packet and the line on the screen. Seems to me since you can set pack length, well, you know, if you set it less than what 76 or 80, maybe there's a relationship. If you said it more than 80, there wouldn't be if you've got an 80-line screen. That is. Um, remember, though, when you're typing, if you, if you hit a carriage return, that automatically packetizes everything. So regardless of whether or not you have a 128-character packet, when you hit that return, it just became somewhat less than a 128-character packet because hitting that carriage return causes, I mean, that, you know, that's usually the enter key or the, you know, the thing where you, where you want something to be done. Mm -hmm. And so it causes the packet to be sent. And so you may or may not use the full 128 bytes. Usually you don't. Usually the terminals require that carriage return line feed in order to come up on, on the next line. I, I know a, a whole... Does it depend on the program you're using, uh, your communications program? Yeah. Yeah, you keep typing. Well, if you keep typing to me, I've got a TRS-80 uh, Model 40 uh, laptop that I use uh, at home, and that one wraps. But uh, you have to be really careful about your terminal programs because there's a number of terminal programs, especially the, the VT-102s, that come up configured to not wrap. And you need to, you know, especially like Procom, you need to specifically go in and make them do line wrap. You need to set up the terminal, uh, the uh, terminal setup. I can't imagine that, that any of these uh, terminal emulators that you get, uh, like Packet Gold and those, I, I'm sure all those must line wrap. But you need to be careful if you're going to use Crosstalk or, uh, or uh, Procom or some of those. You need to make sure that the terminal emulator is set up to line wrap. They don't wrap in the 81st character. It, it just all. types right over. I mean, you just keep seeing the characters at the end of the screen changing. changing. <laughs> so you know that you know, you're getting something yeah. past there. There was a question. Set it to 25 characters. Yes. And you type 30. As soon as you hit the character 
As soon as you hit the keyboard for the 25th character, that packet goes. But it doesn't tell you this. Yet. Oh, no. I'll tell you how you can tell. You start hitting backspace to erase characters. Like, let's say you type 45 characters. You got pack length set at 40. You type 45 characters, and you say, oh, I made an error on the 20th character. So you start backing up, and he won't let you back up only to the 40th character. 41st character, he'll take off the screen and leave the first 40, because that one's now packetized, and as far as he's concerned, it's gone. So it doesn't insert a carriage turn line to No, oh, no, no, no. Mm -mm. Nope. Yeah, see, uh, Dave could have had his, his pack like, uh, set to 10, and we would have gotten, you know, uh, that many packets, but it still would have come out the same. Depending on how those all got chopped up, a couple of those packets could have been very short because it would have had a carriage return line feed, or a carriage return uh, that would have automatically packetized. So several of them would have been short maybe real short, one character, but you don't know. Okay, good questions. Why don't we go to the next slide? Thank you. And this shows, of course, the complete operation between the two channels. This is where, let's just call them station A and station B. Station A sends the SABM, which causes, says, I want to connect to you. And the UA says, OK, I accept your connect. I'm not busy. I'm able to receive and all of that kind of stuff. And so station A begins sending packets. Remember, we start numbering packets. This is our sent count. And remember that an iframe can also say receive count. So we send zero, and we expect from B, we expect zero. We send one and ex still expect zero because we haven't received anything. So B says, OK, I got your zero and one. I expect number two next. So we send number two, we send number three, we send number four, and he comes back with a receiver ready five saying, I got your two, three, and four. Not only that, I got him in order. Everything is just hunky dory. Now I understand that there's some time, or, you know, th there's some timing that's going on in here, and part of the timing may be just circuit activity to, you know, where other stations are talking. So this is uh, pretty pristine when you look at it this way. But when you actually listen to the circuit, it, it, uh, it can have all kinds of things going on in between. Any questions? This is, this is really just a, a, an amplification of what we looked at before showing the, the original connect, the UA, and all of that kind of stuff. OK, uh, next slide. Can we give that uh, little side thing to one of these folks here? There we go. Thank you. There's three timers, and rather than spending a lot of time talking about uh, the, the T1 being an acknowledgement timer and a T2 being a response delay and an, in, and an inactive link uh, timer, let's look and see on the next slide what these actually do in, in real life. I like working off of these. Uh, uh, off of these things here, because here's this. Uh, this talks about the T1 timer, and when I send a SABM, I start my T1 timer, and that's 
Um, Bill, uh, the the T1 timer is normally a three-second timer. So if you don't get a response within three seconds, and this uh, on the um, on the PK-232, this is called FRAC, F-R-A-C-K. That really is the T1 timer. So when I send out a SABM, I'm going to wait up to three seconds to receive this UA. As soon as I receive it, I'm going to stop my T1 timer and that SABM has been satisfied. <coughs> when I send out this first iframe, uh, when I send out uh, frame zero, um, this is shown uh, where and I don't know how this can happen, but this is showing where he's going to send me a receiver ready uh, at the same time that I'm transmitting uh, my frame one. Well, this will work if you're on a full duplex line, which in regular X.25, that's the case. That really does work that way. You're going to be sending frame one and he can turn right around and send you an, an acknowledgement at the same time that you're sending the next frame. So you send zero, he can acknowledge number uh, zero by saying, I'm expecting your number one next during the same period of time that I'm sending number one. But you'll notice here that I set, I start my T1 timer as soon as I get this receiver ready back, I stop my T1 timer and I immediately restart it because this frame is now outstanding. And when I don't get an acknowledgement within that three seconds, I've got to do something. And the way I do it is I use a receiver ready as a demand for a response. And I set my P bit or my pole bit saying, I really want you to respond to me. So I send a receiver ready and he sends a receiver ready back with the final bit saying, here's my response and I'm expecting number one next. Well, I already sent number one, so he's saying that he never got my number one. So I resend number one, start my T1 timer, and hopefully he'll, he will acknowledge it this time. If he doesn't, we go through this operation again. My T1 timer expires, I send a receiver ready, saying, tell me where you are, what's going on here? Why didn't I get an acknowledgement to this frame that I sent you? Yes? Yet factor receiver ready one stands for... Oh, this is final. This is, remember that one bit? It's the same bit. It's the same bit on... On this receiver ready, it all depends on whether you are the demander or the responder. If you're going to respond, that bit is called the F bit, or the final bit. If you're the requester, 
That's called a poll bet. I'm polling you. What was the other bit? The poll bit and the final. Yeah, you'll see it referred to as the P slash F bit. It's the same bit. It's just whether you're in a demanding or a re I got a smart remark that I'm not going to make. <laughs> it all depends on whether you're the uh, you're the demander or the responder. If you're using this to determine where you know which which uh, receive. Because at this point, he really doesn't know if uh, he, he didn't get a response back. Now, does that mean that he didn't get the frame in the first place? Or didn't we receive the response? Either one could be okay. This could just as easy have been a receiver ready too. if for some reason that response got clobbered. Mm -hmm. Duplex. Well, Duplex. yeah, it's it's uh, balance mode. It means I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait till the channel is clear. Then can that happen that way? That you would send that one? No, before no. You the technology? Um, now, see, this is assuming that these both started transmitting at the same time. Yeah. If I started transmitting at exactly the same time that he did, I wouldn't be able to receive his response here. Right? <coughs> and we're assuming that he received his response. So from that respect, the slide is maybe just a little off in as much as it's explaining a full duplex circuit rather than the the half duplex or you know, wait until the channel is clear type of operation that we're used to in packet radio. Yes? On uh, your TNC, do you have a full duplex parameter? Should that be set off then? No. That's uh, that's, whoops, uh, the, the half duplex, full duplex is for, um, at least I'm thinking that it's uh, for whether you want uh, feedback or not to your uh, terminal. Um, yeah, you don't want it in, uh, you don't want it in half duplex mode because you're going to get feedback. You can have to, you get to or yeah, precisely. OK, let's go to that next slide. And here we see the use of a um, of a receiver not ready. It's used as a um, as a positive response. In other words, it acknowledged the frames. Let's look and see what happened. So up here there was the the uh, the Sabm and the UA, and we're assuming we came into this conversation kind of in the middle. So station A here sent an iframe. They sent zero. We sent one. And uh, at that point, he stopped. And the B station sent a receiver not ready. And a receiver not ready is like a receiver ready in as much as it does allow you to be able to acknowledge. And he said, I'm, or he said, I'm expecting number two next. So he said, I got zero and one, but don't send me any more. My buffer is full, or for some reason, I can't go any further. So 
So I accepted accept your receiver now ready and I wait excuse me, I wait and um, I've I've got uh, I've got some more iframes that I wanna send here. So I sent a receiver ready with the pole bit set and he responds back to me since I had the pole bit set he's got to respond to me and he sets his F bit saying and in this case he sends me a receiver now ready saying I still got your zero and one and I'm expecting two next. At some point later in time he became unbusy as buffer printed out or whatever happened within his TNC he's now ready to receive and so he sent a receiver ready on his own saying I'm ready to receive now. So you see how a TNC can pace the other end. One of those timers that thing determines when you sent RR0 the first time? Um, it says a timeout first. Yeah. Which timeout is that? Yeah, we're still talking about the T1 timer. So when I receive this receiver ready, I come out with my iframe and we would go on then with our conversation. Okay, we're going to um, we're going to uh, jump into uh, what happens during some of these error conditions. If we look at the next slide, So what happened here is we've got the same three frames that we seem to have always ready and waiting from station A. And this time he sends zero. So we had the SAP in the UA up here somewhere. We're looking at this conversation somewhere in the middle. He sends number zero. Then he sends one, but one for some reason because of noise or interference on the channel doesn't get here. In other words, what happened was the frame check sequence, remember that sequence, that two, the two bytes at the end, doesn't match the information preceding it. And when that happens, regardless of whose call letters are in there, regardless of whether it's got the p-bit set, or regardless of any of those sorts of things, he discards it because he can't depend on any of the information in there. So he gets zero okay. One goes away, but he does get two. Well, that's an odd situation. You know, what, what really would be nice is if you could have a protocol that said, I got zero and two, but I need number one. Because what's gonna happen here is he's gonna send a reject and a reject frame has got a, uh, it acts kind of like a receiver ready, but it's for this particular case where you do get some of the frames good. You do get, a, do get a good frame here, and you know that you need to respond and tell them something. So you say, reject, I'm expecting number one next. So what he's saying is, is resend one and any other frames that you had. Let's say that we had um, 
Max frame set to seven. We send zero and one, and one gets clobbered. We send two, three, four, five, and six. So we got seven frames, and he gets two, three, four, five, and six okay. And then station A stops. This is still the response that he's going to send. He's going to send me number one through whatever. So you have to start over from the last good received one. Would be kind of nice if we could just say, yeah, I got, I got zero and two and three and four and five and six, but not number one. But right now the protocol doesn't allow us to be able to do that. So we have to start all over from scratch. That's why on a channel that's particularly um, bad for noise, like HF, you need to keep your max frames to some amount lower than seven. Otherwise you run into these situations where first one makes it, or maybe the first one doesn't make it, but the second, third, fourth, and fifth do and he's going to tell you to resend the whole thing anyway. And you see that going on on HF channels if you ever monitor, where you can hear better than the person he's transmitting to. You see him resend those frames, several frames he winds up resending time after time after time. going to receive everything that's on that same frequency. Oh, yeah. Meant for you or not. That's right. So if you receive, let's say, somebody's transmission that wasn't meant for you, but if it failed parity checks, <coughs> you screw you up? Because you don't know who, whether it was meant for you or not. No, because if, if the parity doesn't work, I throw it away anyway. You mean it is even checking parity on ones that are not addressed to you? Uh, no. Uh, yeah, if you've got it set to monitor, then it's going to, yeah, yes. But um, under normal operation, yeah, if you've got it set to monitor and you want it to monitor only good frames that you receive, which is normally the way that you've set it, you know, when you don't want it in junk mode. Yeah, it's decoding everything, and as long as that frame check sequence is correct, it'll throw it up on your display. Yes, Liz? Joe, isn't there a parameter you can set to where you have to recognize every one before you can go to the other one? Otherwise, you have to be recognized number one, except that before you can send. Yeah, if we had, if we had uh, max frame set to one, okay. you would send one frame, wait for an acknowledgement. If you don't get it, you send the receiver ready. That's and that, that's kind of, that's kind of the way that uh, things run on HF radio. Usually you set your max frames to two. And what happens during a, uh, uh, during a, either a very busy channel or one that's got a lot of uh, noise on it is you wind up sending a packet waiting for an acknowledgement. You don't get it. T1 timer expires, send a receiver ready, and that's why things are so slow on HF, or at least appear to be slow. Yes? The, the PNC, I'm trying to visualize what's happening inside of it. Does it have a a place that it backs up the packet that was just sent so that if it gets called for again it has it available? Yeah, you, it doesn't throw anything away until it gets the acknowledgement. When this reject comes in and said, I received your zero, I'm looking for number one next, he can throw zero away because he knows that this end got it. He can wipe it out of memory and start writing a new packet in its place. Sends the packet and also stores a duplicate copy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he doesn't get rid of anything until he gets the receiver ready. Or in this case, this is, this is a positive response. 
This is one of those things that allows you too to be able to keep that circuit going a little bit quicker. Because, you know, if I don't get this one, well, I'm not going to respond, you know, I'm just going to sit here, uh, you know, whatever. This one here is, I can't use it. So even though I get it, I still throw it away. I got it. I received it good. I received it perfectly. The frame check sequence matches, but I had to throw it away. That's okay. I'm going to tell them right away that I need to see uh, number one and number two again. Yes? On VHF, where is the trade-off between max frame one, which means you're getting a lot more acknowledgement, and max frame seven, which may mean that, he, that you have to send six frames over? Um, uh, I normally run with uh, uh, max frame seven, but it's really not so important from my end because I really, I honestly can't type that fast anyway. Even though I brag about it, I, there's no way in heck I can type that fast. But uh, you're not necessarily being a bad citizen by, or a bad citizen on VHF, uh, provided that the circuit is not real busy. When the circuit gets busy, uh, you would be a good citizen to, to reduce your, your max frames. But I don't think, Bill, what do you think as far as VHF, max frame? Yeah, if you're just typing, uh, typing away, you know, max frame of 7 is, is fine. If you're uploading a file, either Prince TNC or a BBS, then you probably would want to cut it down to about 5 or so and run pack length at about 80. But, uh, that's basically true. HF is a different story. As long as you're using the normal protocol, you're, you're, you're running through the normal timers to gain access to the line, that you send your seven packets and you wait for an acknowledgement, you wait T1 timer time for an acknowledgement, and that the other station is waiting for its normal uh, random amount of delay you're really not being a bad citizen because everybody has a chance at the line. We have a little bit of a conflict with some of the parameters that are set up in TCP IP when they do file transfer and they never let you have access to the line. And that's not a fault with TCP IP, it's a fault with the way that it's set up. So it's just a you know just a matter of the way that it's set up. Anyway, so you understand that if one of these gets clobbered, you need to retransmit in any others that follow. But we get this far and we can in fact go. Yes. If I've sent my seven, I've received UA yes. and I'm into my information. And I'm giving him my life history. I'm typing away. How much of this am I going to be aware of? Am I going to know that something's been rejected? Um, uh, you might when you're uh, when you can't get through and your buffer is full. Um, you've you've reached your your max frame, and now maybe you want to get in and look and see what's going on with the circuit. When, when nothing seems to want to get through. Yeah, you need to be aware of these things, but under normal circumstances, that's all transparent to you. Yes. Uh, Joe, if you decide you're having a lot of trouble and too much noise, we'll say on HF, and you have this situation, can you cut it down from like from one to seven? Can you chop it off uh, uh, once about half of it? <laughs> No, what, what, once the packet has been formed, you can't, change it. you can't change it. No, he's, yeah, boy, I've done that too. I'll, uh, yeah, uh, you know, you got the parameters set in it for VHF, and you go over to the HF side, and you type this horrendously long line, right? 
So you got, uh, you know, you got an 80 character line, and the circuit is really bad. You really should be running about, uh, about 20 character packets. You don't realize that until, uh, until he disconnects because he can't get this 80 character packet through. So then you need to reestablish the connection, make sure that your pack length is 20, and start all over again. So, yeah, that, uh, yeah, uh, you, I've tried that. It doesn't work. Once the packet's there, he's going to send that Hummer. That's all there is to it. Yes? If you were using multiple digis, would you want to use a smaller max frame so that it doesn't have to resend X number of packets through each digi? Yeah, we're going to talk you out of using those digis anyway. Right, Bill? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, as and, and Bill will bring this out. Bill's going to talk uh, at some length of connections and just what kind of problems a digi can cause in terms of of uh, of circuit usage and, uh, and and so on. If there's any way around, I mean, digis are really nice. They really are. Um, they they allow you to be able to you know talk through to some people where you normally couldn't. And in those circumstances, you know, you're, you're locked in. There's nothing else you can do. But if there's any other way to do it, and Bill, you and I have seen it. We've seen guys use uh, six or seven digis when they could have connected through two nodes and handled things so much more efficiently. Because once you give it to the node, you're done. You can forget it. He's going to get it there. Or he'll let you know that he didn't get it there. So I don't mean to, you know, but yeah, and, and, and Bill will talk about, you know, what, what you need to do uh, with those, you know, with that digi situation. And you need to cut back on your, on your number of packets. You need to cut back on its length because it's now got, uh, you know, a factor of two times more probability that it's going to get clobbered. The digis don't set the three and a half bit, right? No. <coughs> so it has to go through the whole chain to the receive station. That's the whole. The that's right, yeah. precisely. And that's where in the problem lies. And every time that you digi, you have a possibility of it getting clobbered, even on VHF. Uh, well, Bill, you've got some numbers too that to, to back it up. What what the odds are of getting getting uh, uh, getting from one end of California to the other, you know, the odds if you don't run with, with, with nodes are, you know, are impossible. And with nodes, it's not only possible, it's done every day. Um, this is, uh, does that mean I'm early, Bill? Yeah, Why don't we take a 10 minute break? Dick here show you a little, uh, little neat thing he just picked up. Show you some of the things that are uh, coming out. This is a TNC with a 40 column printer. And it's available. I picked it up through Henry Radio on sale for 99 bucks. So it's, uh, it's pretty good. I've still got to learn how to run the thing yet. Uh, but uh, Dick, that works off of, that, that works VHF only? Can you run it HF? I don't know. <laughs> that would be the greatest thing for mobile radio ever, for, for HF mobile radio. Wouldn't that be great? Print is too tight, too small. <laughs> well, it depends, it depends on your age. <laughs> for two dollars, two dollars, you get the big old magnifying glass. Yeah, I can say whatever I want because he's riding with me. <laughs> well, that's super. So, I've got to learn how to dump the buffer. Do you know how to do that with these things? Because if you listen for a little bit, 
it all goes to the damn printer. Oh, yeah. The tape comes spilling out. And you turn it off, you unplug it, you turn it back on, and it just keeps right on where it was going. <laughs> yeah, that could be... It Maybe could be expensive. Way, we'll let you, we'll, we'll give you an update in a week or two. Once you plug in, you're plugging full of the plug. Yeah. 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 Still in there? Yeah. 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 Some kind of storage. Yeah. 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 It's got a paper storage. You've got an 80 pound roll in your back. Before we get started, I, I know this is tough to read, and hopefully next week we'll have the LCD overhead that can project up on the screen. But again, to show you what you can do, I connected to W0TX, which is the Denver Radio Club gateway that interconnects 145.01 to 14103, 20 meters. I asked it who it could hear. We won't worry about that now because we're going to cover this. But anyway, I told it to connect on 20 meters to KS8L-7 in Ohio. Came back here and said, link made, connected to node KS8L, channel A. The multiband QSO converse mode. So down here I said, okay, now connect me to a node called CWQSO on two meters in Ohio. It came back, said link made. QSO, Canal, Winchester, Ohio, and I'm now on a conference bridge there. So we're sitting here on two meters with a couple of watts, going through the gateway, out to Ohio, back onto the two meter system to a conference bridge that has inputs on 10 meters, 20 meters, 18 uh, megahertz, 17 meters, and uh, 40 meters. So during the daytime, you get some pretty good QSOs. Now I asked it who's on there. And it's starting to tell me there's a KE8SEX. -S Good call. Is that what that is? <laughs> DEX. <laughs> One track mine. <laughs> there's an N8LPX. KE0QA. That startled me. I forgot. It's not my call. I was expecting to see me there. So anyway, I, I asked it who's on the bridge. There's some eight stations back there and, and us. So now I can type and it'll go out to everybody's connected to the bridge, or I can type and direct it to one guy on the bridge. Now, if you can read this, it says KB8DEX, where are you going? N8LPX says, hello from Don. Remote QTH is coming up now. So you can talk to everybody, or you can talk to any one person on this bridge. So that shows, you know, you can be sitting in your house with one watt, a little whip out the window or whatever, and work the world on packet. That's the neat thing. This bridge equipment, is that commercial, or is that something? Like no, it's just a TNC it? that they uh, put a ROM chip in. Oh, okay. We hope to have a conference bridge set up with TX when we get our antennas up and, and all that kind of thing. So we could even maybe even have a packet net, you know, everybody just logs in on Sunday night at 8 or something like that. So you get a big old round table going here. Okay, so, well, 20 meters gets shaky about this time of night right now. So you'll see it come up and go down and, and whatever. But anyway, that's uh, some of the neat things you can do without having a big station. For, pur <coughs> Excuse me. For purposes of setting uh, max frames, pack length, and that kind of thing, is this VHF or HF packet? Yes. This is, uh, we're set up for VHF. The node automatically tailors pack length, max frame, whatever for HF. So the, the node not only, uh, see it says N8 Q O O X signed on. So here somebody else just came in the bridge after us. So you'll see people come and go. But anyway, to answer your question, not only does the node change from 1200 where we are to 300 on HF, 
It also changes max frame. It unpacketizes all the stuff you sent and then repacketizes it. Okay, so the sysop sets up the node and then he may tailor it between morning and evening depending upon band conditions. DEX says, uh, here come the people. Hello, hello. So I'll say hi, Joe in Denver. We'll see what happens. Now that'll go out to everybody's on this bridge because I just sent it to everybody. So that's some of the neat things you can do without having giant stations and big towers and whatever on packet that you can't do in any other mode. Bill, can you change the size of those uh, characters in any way? On that screen? Yes. No. Or set, you can't do nothing with them. Huh? Well, we haven't figured out how to do it. That's why we hope to have next week have the overhead so we can just project it up, make it look like this. I just thought I'd try it just to demo another thing. You know, we've talked to Tanker a couple times, and hopefully, uh, maybe George can get down here. He is back in town. Yeah, he's back in town. He's on shore leave now. Did you? Yeah. Okay. So he's going to try to get down here. Oh, okay. Great. Okay, let's go ahead and get into this. Um, can you go ahead and uh, change the slide, whoever's the slide changer there? Now, what you need to do is keep this page in front of you. It starts off by command, CMD, comma, or colon, C space W0TX-7. Okay. The thing on the board is what's on the next page. What I want to do is kind of give you an example now of what Joe has been talking about for the last uh, two weeks, or does it seem like two years? This stuff is pretty heavy. Anyway, what this is, is we're going to be somebody that's going to turn on our station, get on 14501, and watch what's going on. Okay? That's what this slide represents. The page represents the operator, in this case, me. On your page, at the top, I have a command prompt, and I type C space W0TX-7, which is what I did here earlier. Now, what happens when I type C space W0TX, we, the class that are sitting out here monitoring the channel, we see this, W6OAV-15. Now, let's not worry about the dash 15 right now. That's not really important. We'll get into that next week. The important thing is W6OAV, asterisk, right arrow, W0TX-7, C, comma, P. Remember two weeks ago, Joe said, when you type C space somebody, you send out a SABM? That's how the SABM appears on your TNC when you tell your TNC, I want to see what's going on on the channel. It represents the originating address, the destination address. This is a command for connect or SABM, and the P bit is set. In other words, we're showing the addressing and what it is. It's a connect packet, a SABM, with the P bit set. set. The P bit is set because we are sending that out as a command, and we are demanding a answer from W0TX. If I'm sending something, and I have the F bit set, I'm telling the guy, oh, I'm going to send you this, I'm going to send you something else, you don't have to answer. But if I set the, the P bit, then I'm demanding an answer. I'm telling the other end, I'm not sending you anything else. I'm sending you this, and I'm demanding an answer. W0TX-7, our node, Source, destination, W6OAV, UA, final. UA, unnumbered acknowledgement. The F bit saying, okay, I'm answering. Now the important thing to notice here is this little asterisk. The ad asterisk is placed next to the address to indicate who you heard that from. This could have been W6OAV via 
Digi 1, Digi 2, Digi 3, Digi 4, W0TX. And I heard Digi 3. There'd be an asterisk by Digi 3. That's who I heard. I didn't hear Digi 2 and Digi 1 and W6OAV. That's how you know who repeated this frame that you're copying. You might see the same frame repeated three times. The first one would be asterisk by Digi 1, the second one by Digi 2, the second frame by Digi 3. You happen to hear all three of them. It's a very common question you get. How come I see the same iframe three times on my screen? Well, the reason you did is because you saw three different people passing the frame down. I think this will become clearer when we get into nodes and, and digis, but that's the point to keep in mind here, wherever the asterisk is, that's the person you heard send it. Up here, my TNC heard W6OAV-15 send this frame. Here, it heard W0TX send the frame, okay? Clear as mud? Says here, uh, hello, name here is Skip in Columbus, Ohio. And WD0, uh, W, or DEX says, ha, ha, ha. We missed a frame somewhere in that because <laughs> See, so in other words, that's the other problem you may have here is the frame gets corrupted. You may not get it at all. Okay. Anyway, when this UA comes back to W6OAV's TNC, his TNC generates the second line on your page, connected to W0TX-7. So in other words, I type connect. W0TX-7, the connect goes out, it might go out three times. Then all of a sudden, W0TX-7 hears it, he sends the UA back. That causes my TNC to say, you are now connected to W0TX-7. That came out of my TNC. Now, on the sheet of paper here, it says connected to wild node, da 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 da, Denver Radio Club, da 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 da, command line, da 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 da. That all comes from W0TX. We see it right here. W0TX-7, he's the one that sent it, to W6OAV, iframe, expecting zero from W6OAV, and this is my zero that I'm sending out. See, because W6OAV hasn't sent any iframes yet, he just sent a connect request. So I'm expecting from you, OAV, number zero, and this is my zero. And here's the information contained in here. Now I reach the end of pack length, so I stop. W0TX-7 stops, I should say. Then he sends the next frame. Now it's number one. Still expecting zero from OAV because he hasn't said anything yet. And there's that command line. Okay? So that's where all that came from that, is, that appears on W6OAV's TNC. Now, up to the third line down, where the IOO is, the first O is you're expecti expecting frame zero. The second O is what? This is my number zero from TX. See, in other words, TX is sending an iframe. He's telling OAV, I'm expecting zero from you. I haven't got anything yet. This is my number zero. This is the NS. He sends it. He stops at that point because he's reached pack length. So then he sends the next iframe. See, now it's incremented to number one. Okay, from W0TX, my number one now. I'm still expecting zero from you, OAV. Action at zero is your number one. Make up the one you covered last week, Joe. At zero is your number one translation. Yeah, that's your first frame, because you go zero to seven, not one to eight. Okay. Frame zero through seven, uh-huh. So that is the first frame. I'm expecting your first frame, which is zero. This is my first frame, which is zero. This is my second frame, which is one. See? That's what's nice about computers. You know, you're always one behind what you really think you are, and da 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 da, and all that. W6OAV. How's the weather in Denver? Nice. There. Whoops. <laughs> Can't blame that on conditions like you can in Riddy. Packet is error free. Anyway, W6OAV, there's the asterisk, sends a receiver ready 
saying, I am now expecting number two from you. Zero, one, the next one you're going to send me TX is number two. So TX knows he got zero and one because he got a receiver ready with a, with a two, saying, I'm expecting number two from you, TX. So now we're sitting there. If you look at that sheet of paper, there's the command line, and then you see that little N. That's W6OAV saying, give me a, a list of your nodes, and we're going to get into this next week. So this is the first iframe from OAV. Ta-da! W6OAV. I hear him sending to W0TX this iframe. And it contains the, the N. Can that be a capital N or a small N? Does it matter? No, it doesn't make any difference. Okay. And he's saying, I'm still expecting number two from you, and this is my number zero. So W0TX-7 says, okay, I am now expecting number one from you. And this is my number two, zero, one, two. So I used an info frame to acknowledge an info frame, where here I used a receiver ready to acknowledge it because OAV hadn't typed anything yet, so I couldn't send him an info frame. But if there's an info frame ready to go, I'll use that to acknowledge rather than sending a receiver ready and then an info frame. So TX says, okay, here's my number two frame. I send the stuff into pack length. My number three frame, still expecting number one. Okay, so far? Next slide. Oh. I thought everybody went to sleep on me. <laughs> anyway, here's, here's info frame number four, still expecting one. Info frame number five, still expecting one. I stop at this point, IW0TX, OAV says, receiver ready, I'm now expecting six, so TX knows that five and four and three and two got there. So TX goes ahead and sends number six, the command line again, which is at the bottom of the, uh, of the page there. Well, OAV decides it's time to hit the hay so he types a B for goodbye. That is my info frame, number one, because the one before was number zero. OAV is a great typist. He typed an N, and then he types a B, and that was tough. But he didn't misspell it. He's expecting number seven, because he'd already gotten number six. So again, he, OAV uses an iframe to acknowledge an iframe. The buy tells TX he wants to go away, so TX sends a disconnect with the pole bit set, saying, go away, but acknowledge before you do. I demand you acknowledge, pole bit set. OAV says, okay, boss, UA, final bit. And with that, the disconnected from W0TX appears on the bottom of the screen. Now, after Joe's dissertation, does this kind of add a little feeling to it? I missed something here on uh, all the commands. B-C-J-N-X. Pardon me? I missed something somewhere. I didn't get all these commands. B-C-J-N and X as to what they mean. Did I? Oh, we're not going to go into that yet. That's, that's how to run a node. Okay. Uh, all we did was we connected to it. And then I typed an N, which tells the, the node, give me a list of your nodes. So he gave this list that you see on this page. We're going to explain that list next week. And then I typed a B for goodbye. And TX said adios and disconnected me. Now next week, we're going to go into what all this stuff is, how to use it, how to read this stuff. The purpose of this, these two slides here is just to kind of solidify what Joe's been talking about the last two weeks. I-frames and P-bits and next, you know, ready, uh, receiver readies and 
and these kind of things. So don't worry about the actual text, it's the, the, the frames and how they interreact. I don't know if TNC is different in this respect, but to see this information on my screen, I need, uh, at least on the MFJ, to use either MCOM or MCON. Uh, Can you tell me the difference? Yes. I want to use yes, you're leading me into my next page here. Um, you have different levels of monitoring on TNCs. Some are a little more sophisticated than others. Um, on the PK-232 and most of the other TNCs, you have two commands, monitor and MCON. Monitor says, what do I want to monitor when I'm sitting there? MCON says, what do I want to monitor while connected? M for monitor, CON for connected. Our big round table is still going on here. MCON says, what of this kind of stuff do I want to monitor while I'm connected? Monitor command allows me to define what I want to monitor when I'm not connected. For example, let's say I want to monitor all this stuff while it's going on. But when somebody connects to me, I don't want to see all this stuff. I only want to see what he's sending to me because if I monitor all this stuff plus what he's sending, I've got to sort it all out. So I would leave MCON at zero and monitor at whatever level, and I'll get into that in a minute. So I'm sitting there monitoring all this stuff flying around, seeing who's saying what, see if anybody's talking about me behind my back, you know, and all that. And then somebody connects to me, the TNC says, okay, I'm now in the connected mode. What does he want me to monitor while connected? Well, MCON says, is set to monitor nothing. So therefore, I only see what the person types to me. Then he disconnects from me. Now I'm back to whatever the monitor command is, and I start monitoring all this stuff. Now, a lot of times, I will monitor while connected. In answer to the question Joe had earlier, if I'm pounding away, particularly on HF, I want to see how well my stuff is getting through. So in answer to your question, on HF a lot, I will turn on MCON, and I will watch all this stuff going, and I will see how fast this is incrementing, or I will see that I'm getting a lot of rejects. If I see a lot of rejects, then I start decreasing my... my uh, my uh, max frame down because I know that he's, you know, not getting the first but the second and third, so I got to do them all over again and all that kind of stuff. So I will actually turn on MCON and watch all this stuff so that I know and I can start tailoring my parameters to, to speed it up. Like Joe was mentioning the other day, I went from VHF to HF connected to my buddy in California and I uploaded I upload all the around table articles to him. I said, here's the latest one, Denny, and I uploaded it. Nothing happened, nothing happened, and I went over and I checked and went, oh, I have a max frame seven, pack length 128. So I, all I could do is just disconnect, force to disconnect, change my parameters, and then start to upload again. Moved it down to a max frame of two and pack length of 40, and they all went through. So, I mean, you know, and I, I had, you know, two pages of stuff and I was right in the middle of it and I had to disconnect it all. Anyway, um, on your PK-232, you basically have six levels of monitoring while you're not connected, which is the monitor command, or monitoring while you are connected, the MCON command. If I don't want to monitor anything, I go monitor zero, which says I don't want to monitor anything. Okay, And MCON of zero, which says I don't want to monitor anything if somebody connects to me. Now, if I want to monitor for CQs and IDs, beacons, where people come up periodically in ID, I will set monitor to one, M space one. That tells the TNC to put anything on the screen that's what's called a UI, unnumbered information. Remember that guy? So therefore, I can periodically look at my screen and see, oh, so-and-so called CQ three minutes ago so-and-so ID'd, uh, you know, whatever, okay? That's why it's not necessary to sit there and bang away CQs one after the other after the other because if somebody's watching for it, they'll periodically look at the screen and they'll see the first one you sent. If you send 20 of them in a row, they'll probably say, oh, the heck with that guy. I forgot, I had my mic on. <laughs> so anyway, 
Um, weather is clear and 45 degrees in Ohio, if anybody cares. And they're all yakking. Columbus. Columbus. But anyway, you, if you can read it, you can see how you get the different call signs on the left and what they're saying. There are a bunch of guys yakking. Anyway, if you uh, want to see CQs and beacons, you make monitor one. If you want to see CQs and beacons while you're connected to somebody, and I do this an awful lot, then I, you leave MCON in one, on one. And that way you see the text coming in, like on that page you were looking at earlier, and right in the middle of it you might see a CQ from so-and-so, this sort of thing. thing I will see on my screen is I'll see an M down there or a, that I have something. If I'm going to be talking with somebody connected, then I'm on like channel O. And the monitor channel is the only place that all that other stuff appears. And then you're going back and forth. Or is there some way that you know of to actually have that stuff come in on your, on your channel that you're talking on while you're connected? So you don't have to keep going back to the monitor channel to pick up these. Oh, you're running some kind of a software package. Compact app. Oh, okay. Uh, that's that's a function of your, your software package. I'm not oh. familiar with that one. Okay. See, if you're running a dumb terminal mode, then you'll see it all. Then you'll, you'll see it all, and the PK232 will come up, and it'll say channel 0, call sign, da-da, channel 1, call sign, da-da, you know, that sort of thing. If you're running like pack of gold, which is what I run, then you have one window that's all your monitor stuff. You have a window that you're talking on, and another window you're talking on. And if you're on one channel and somebody sends you something on the other channel, it'll say data on channel one, you go over there and you look at it. If you want to look at the monitor, you go to the monitor window. See, so that's a function of your software, and I'm not familiar with that one. Joe, you ever heard of that one? No. Anybody else? I think I can uh, answer that one. I need Great. To uh, with the 232. The ITF uh, function P9 brings up your parameter screen. And in mid operation, you can change your yeah, ITF. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's the dark one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if the functions operate the same, uh, well, yeah, but if how do you know where somebody's, thing, uh, somebody's hands are located, like WD7, AJP? Well, let's get into that when we get into nodes. Okay. So ask it when we get there, because I don't get uh, sidetracked here, and then we'll. Okay, we just had KSL eight, KS eight L, sign on, and uh, he's in. Uh, he's in Canal Winchester, Ohio. If you know where that is, fifteen miles southeast of Columbus. He says hello, Skip. And things like that. Having TV eye problems. Having TV eye problems. Hmm? What'd you send him? I just told the guys in the bridge that we're demoing this to the packet class. This is a little one side because I'm really not talking to these guys and every once I shove something out there, so but you get used to that. Um, anyway, level one is for UIs, unnumbered information frames. And those are used to carry CQs, beacons, things like that. Or remember we talked about round tables? <coughs> if you want to have several guys carry on a round table, they would all set their MCON in their, well, well it depends on the mode, their monitor and their MCON both to one. Okay. So what that means is anytime anybody type something and they're not connected they just type and hit a carriage return that goes out as a UI frame because if I were connected to somebody then every frame I send out I'm expecting acknowledgement back but if I am in the unconnected mode in other words I got the command line and I just say so hi Bill in Denver carriage return it goes out as an unnumbered information frame I'm not expecting an answer back because I'm not connected to anybody 
So that would be the only way to have round tape. Yes. You set your monitor to one, and if you're going to be connected or somebody's going to connect to you, you might want to set MCON to one so if they connect you, it won't shut off your, your, uh, your unnumbered thing. So that's how you do it. If you and you and myself want to have a, a round table, we would all set our UI, I mean our, our um, uh, monitor to one, and I would type, and you would see my unnumbered information frame, and you would see my unnumbered unnumber information frame. You might answer me, and he'll see it, and I'll see it. The only disadvantage is, if you type, and the wife happens to fire up the vacuum cleaner, that frame gets corrupted, and I don't see it, and you don't know it, but you get it because you didn't get corrupted. So that's the disadvantage on a round table on unnumbered frames. You say, how's things going? And if he doesn't answer, you say, how's things going? Again. Could you parlay that in with the use of the multiple channels? Where like on, on channel zero, you're running the way you just described, round table. Okay. But on channel one, you connect with one of those. Right. Then I would want M come back and forth. You could sort of whisper in that one fellow's ear, if you will. Right. In other words, we have these. Remember, we talked about these logical channels. Yeah. I could set up a logical channel to you. I could be on my zero to you, my one to you. And then I would type something to you on my logical zero. You wouldn't see it unless you had the monitor, the MCON on. If you did, then you'd see it. You know. And then, if I wanted to send an unnumbered information frame out to both of you. Let's, let's say we're, 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 we are actually having a round table. Anytime I would go to an unconnected channel, like channel two, I'd be in the command mode and I'd say, boy, did you hear what he said? And then, you know, and that would go out to both of you guys. But if I went to channel zero and said, did you hear what he said? Only you would get it. Now, if he has his monitor on, he'd hear it. He'd see it. But if he has his monitor or his MCON, I should say, to, to zero or, or just to one, then he wouldn't really see that. So you could run round table while you are running several logical channels. Does that answer? Is this being done through the software or through the uh, TNC? Through the TNC. The software makes it a lot easier to do. Uh, well, the, the software automates things. For example, let's say I got a channel zero here, channel one here. Then I, I, I just hit a function key and it puts me on channel zero and I type. Hit a function key, puts me over on channel one, I type to him. And then I go to hit my function key again to go to an unconnected window and type something and, it, and that goes out as a UI frame. As opposed to actually issuing the commands to the T and C to force it to, to change channels. For example, if I'm using a dumb terminal, then I got to tell the TNC everything I want it to do. I go Control C to put me in the command mode, and then some special character that you picked out. For my TNC, I have a, a uh, plus. So I go plus zero, and that puts my TNC onto channel zero. Then I do a K to go back to converse mode. Then I type on channel zero. And now I want to go to channel one, I do a control C to get me back to the command mode, plus one, which now moves me to channel one, do a K to go back to the converse mode, and then I type to you. And then if I want to send out a UI, I go back to the command mode, do a plus two. Now my channel two is not connected to anybody. And I say, hello out there, and that goes out as a, as a UI frame. So I got to tell my TNC each little step to do. Well, if I have a software package, it's just a function key in most of them. I hit a function key and it says you're on zero. <coughs> hit it again, I'm on one. So it's issuing all the commands for me. It simplifies all this stuff. And you'll see this in about three weeks or so when the guys start bringing in the various packages that we're going to demo for you. Did that answer your question? On your PK232, your one is on. Well, I'm going to have somebody that's familiar with MFJs explain that a little bit. Uh, well, mine's even more than that. 232 is even more than that. 232 is a little more sophisticated. Level 1 says, I only want to see unnumbered information frames. Level 2 says, I want to see unnumbered information frames as well as information frames. 
I want to see who else is talking on the channel. Okay. I want to see only information frames. Level three says I want to see unnumbered information frames. I want to see information frames. And I also want to see anybody who's issuing a connect or a disconnect. Okay. Level four says I want to see the UAs and the DMs as well as all the rest of the stuff. Level five says I want to see all the different frames. Level six says I want to see all the information frames plus this stuff. Level six is great when you're doing troubleshooting. It's a data scope. Somewhere you've got these levels written down? Or? Uh, no, because I figured if you had the TNC, you'd be familiar with it. Um, on the MFJs, because each, each TNC is a little different. On the MFJ, you turn monitor on and off and MCOM on and off. And then you have a pass all command. Now, does anybody know on the MFJ, can you, de can you define levels like this? I don't think you can. That's why I like the 232, because I can pick what I want to see when I go into this. It's done a little bit differently. We've got an M all mode. Mm -hmm. Turn on and off. We've got M com, uh, which gives you your protocol information. And then you've got M con, which uh, you see connected. Okay. You see other packages while you're in connected mode. And then there's there's a BBS, uh, well, there's several mm -hmm. different okay. things, all of which are right. either turned on or turned okay. on. Well, most TNCs have some form of, of monitoring the protocol. And some are a little more sophisticated than the others, like the 232. You can define at what level you want to see. And you'll find your, yourself doing this a lot to find out what's going on. Like I mentioned, sometimes if I don't know whether I have my max length and pack length set right, I'll actually watch it while I'm sending it. And if I get a lot of rejects coming back, or uh, I, I see that the frame rate is real slow, or I see it's really, you know, I, I send three, it acknowledges three, da 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 da, I can tailor it as I go along in this sort of thing. Uh, many times somebody will call up and say, I can't connect to so and so, or I da da, I'm getting garbage or whatever. You know, I'll go into this mode so that I'm bridged onto the line as they're talking so I can watch them and see who's not answering or who's doing funny things or who's sending out garbage, you know, things like that. Because RF can get in your TNC and cause garbage, particularly on HF. If the garbage goes in and then the TNC makes a packet out of it, he thinks that garbage is valid data. And he says, here's this packet and this garbage in here is valid. That's what came in. And the other says, oh, okay, that's valid garbage, throws it up on the screen. Mm -hmm. And um, when you're in the conference bridge, it accepts up to eight people. Uh, are you still on an unnumbered frame situation? No, you're connected to the actual bridge. Actually connected. But you're actually. Everybody's reading the same thing. Yeah, yeah. We're going to go into this when we get into the nodes and all that. Because, see, right here we're. <coughs> see now here here look at this. Let me just digress for a minute. Connect request KC0CZ-15. We have users set to one, and we are on channel zero. So he sent a connect request to us, and we sent a DM back to him, which caused his screen to say uh, KE0QA busy. And it put a connect request on here so that we know he tried to connect. So I could go to channel one, even though I got users set to one, I could go to my channel one and connect to him. Because users define how many people can come in. So that's exactly what you see. We talked about this about three weeks ago or four weeks ago. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, on the conference bridge, it's, it's got eight logical ports. And each person connects to his own port. And then when you send something into that port, it goes to all the other ports, unless you type a special command and tell it which port you want it to go to. We'll get into that a little bit more on here. See, we're set up just to copy what everybody's sending. But we, we have our own individual link. Okay, I'm connected to TX. TX is connected to KS8L-7 in Ohio. KS8L-7 is connected on two meters to the node. So they're individual links, so we'll get more into that. So what I picked up off of that, there's a simple command for talking to eight, 
and then there's one other command for talking to any one of the others. Yeah. All of mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll get into that. Okay, any uh, any questions on this? This kind of wraps up the uh, the protocol business. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, if you understand what's going on, not only can you optimize your station for maximum throughput, you can help other people troubleshoot what's going on. That's why it's kind of important to understand all of this stuff. And as you watch it, it'll become clear to you. Next week, we're going to start putting live stuff up here so you can see it. And I think it'll come, it'll come uh, more clear. And we're going to talk about how to use the nodes and, and that sort of thing. Um, let's go ahead and flip to the next slide. You hear a term called windows. Joe's already talked about this. It's called max frame. A lot of people refer to it as a window. In other words, what is my window size? How many frames can I send out before I got to stand back and wait for an answer? Okay. And we have set it up for two. So I say, okay, this guy's typing real fast. He sends out zero and one. Zero and one go out. He stops. He's waiting for an acknowledgement. He gets the acknowledgement saying, I'm expecting number two. I've got zero and one. My window rotates these two. I send out the next two. I wait. I get a receiver ready back, or it could have been an iframe, like we saw before, saying, OK, I'm expecting four. I got two and three. We rotate our window around. So you can see as we go around, you never can have a window bigger than seven, because otherwise you'd be zero all the way back to zero. So you'd have two zeros hanging out there. And boy, would that confuse things. So your window is one to seven. It's just kind of a graphical representation of what Joe was talking about earlier there. OK, uh, any questions? Next slide. Joe, are you reading the dark area of that circle or the light area? The light area. The little light area. <coughs> I took these in a hurry, and they didn't come out real well. Uh, kind of show you what some of the lights are. They vary from TNC to TNC, but they're basically the same. This light here is on. It's called the command light. That, that says that you're in the command mode. In other words, the channel that I am on is not connected to anybody. So if I'm sitting on channel 0 and a UA comes in, I'm sorry, a Sabin comes in from somebody. I will immediately respond with a UA. Command light will go off, and the connect light will come on. I automatically switch to the converse mode. If I start typing, it goes out. Now, once I'm connected to somebody, let's say I'm typing away, and I realize that, hey, my path length is too long. I can do a control C, which will turn off my connect light, put me back in the command mode, then I can type pack length 20. Maybe it was 128. And then I do a K for converse. The command light goes out, and I go back to the converse mode. Actually, these are tied together. <coughs> Uh, next one. Okay, there I'm in the converse mode. Next one. Okay, this is the connect light. I got a little, little tied up here. I wasn't expecting to get this far tonight. Command mode, converse mode, connected. OK? So in other words, let's say that I'm on channel 0 and I'm not connected to anybody, and I'm in the command mode. If I do a control C and then do a K, I go from command to converse mode but I'm not connected. 
and then I type hello out there in radio land, I send out a UI because I'm on, in the converse mode on a non-connected channel. If I do a control C, I go back to the command mode, that goes out, and let's say somebody connected to me on channel one. If I told my TNC to go to channel one, then the connect light would come on. I'm still in the command mode, so I do a K, my converse light would come on, so I, now I'm on the connected channel in the converse mode, and then whatever I type will appear on his screen. Now if I decide, in the example I used earlier, where I want to decrease the path length, I would do control C, <coughs> That would take me out of the converse mode, put me back in the command mode. I would type pack length, whatever, because the THC now knows that I'm talking to it, so it's not going to send this out because I'm in the command mode. Type pack length 20 or whatever. Then I do a K. That goes out because I go out of the command mode. I go back to the converse mode. So let's say, for example, I had two channels going, channel 0 and channel 1. And I'm over on channel one, and I'm typing away, and the fellow on channel zero disconnects. Okay, since I'm on channel one and I'm connected, my connect light is on, my converse light is on, because we're talking. Now, if I were to go to channel zero, in other words, I do a Control C to go to the command mode, which turns on this light, turns off the converse mode. And then I go to channel zero. Both of these lights would be out because channel zero is not connected to anybody. So if I go back to channel one, the connect light will be on, the command light will be on, because I had to issue the command to get to channel one. Then I do a K to go back to converse mode. The command light goes out, the converse light comes on, and I can type away. Now keep in mind, I'm on channel one. There's nothing on channel zero. And then all of a sudden, Les back there connects to me. And it says, hi, Bill, how are you doing? My lights don't change here. I have to go back to the command mode with my control C, move over to channel zero, that'll turn that on because I, I have a connect on channel zero, then I have to do a K to get back to converse mode so that I can talk to Les. Now let's take another example, let's say that I talk to Les, and then he says adios, and I go back to channel one, I finish my QSO, and I sign off, and now I'm not connected to anybody. I'm sitting on channel one. Now Les decides to connect to me again. He connects to me. And on my screen I see, hi Bill, how are you doing? I look at my lights, that one's on, those are not. Okay? Well at this point in time, if I type a K to go to the converse mode, the command goes off, the converse comes on, but my connect is, is not on because I'm on channel one, and if I type, hi, Les, how you doing, and I see this all the time on Packet, it's going to be an unproto that goes out. And if Les isn't set up to monitor unproto, he won't know I tried to talk to him. This is a very common mistake. People see the, the data come up on the screen, hi, how are you doing, and they sit there and go to the converse mode and try to talk to him and don't look at the lights. Don't realize they're on the wrong channel, and everything they're sending is going out as UIs. Okay, so in this case, when it says, hi, Bill, how you doing? I look down and I see that I'm in the command mode. My connect is off. I know that I'm not on the channel he's on. So I do a control C. And on the 232, you can do a CS, which says, what's the status of all your 10 channels? And it'll come up and list all the 10 channels and say who's connected where. And I go, oh, Les is up on channel zero. So I do a, in my case, a plus. You, you can define what your switch character is plus zero in the command mode, all of a sudden this light comes on, and then I do a K to turn off my command and turn on the converse, and I say, hi Les, what you up to? So that's one thing you gotta remember. You've got, most TNCs usually have 10 channels, and you can be on any channel you want, but when somebody connects to you, he's gonna pick the first available channel, 
zero. Okay? So you got to be very careful on that. I see that happen all the time where where uh, had got half a QSO going. That's when it go to the telephone and see if it got through. <laughs> right. <laughs> N8 LPX uses a hammer and a butter knife to keep his Yesu on frequency. Uh, Anyway, you can see the round table still carrying on here. Okay, does that make sense? You've got to remember, you've got logical channels, and you've got to remember when you want to talk to somebody, you've got to be on his channel, and you've got to be in the converse mode. Uh, next slide. Okay. Now, you'll have another light called STA for status. What this is, is I'm in the connected mode, so I'm on a channel that's connected to somebody. I'm in the converse mode, and I've typed, hi Les, how's it going? Hit the carriage return. My TNC sends it out, doesn't get an answer from Les, sends it out. On the third time, I get an acknowledgement back, either an information frame or a receiver ready that it got the packet, then this light goes out, and then this TNC, TNC throws away that packet because it has been acknowledged at the other end. Now, if my pack length is uh, sitting at 40 and I'm typing real fast, and I hit the carriage return, I may have three packets sitting in queue. The first one goes out, it gets act. The second one goes out two, three times because I got my uh, max frame at one. It finally gets act. The third one goes out two or three times, finally gets act. Then at that time, the STA goes out. So it takes, it takes an acknowledgement to turn that light out. If you're sitting there wondering how come the light's not going out, maybe that's when you turn MCON on to see what's going on. Is he sending you rejects? Is he sending you FMRs, remember frame rejects? Is it just taking a bunch of tries? Most TNCs have some form of STA light. Most of them have a send light too. That's when your push to talk turns on. So you'll, you'll be here in the connected mode, converse mode, and you'll see this going on, off, on, off, on, off, and all of a sudden that goes out. The other thing we talked about, and this is where the turning on the protocol is, I'm sitting on my channel zero, less connects to me, my connect light goes on, I go to the converse mode, I say, hi, Les, how's it going? On, off. I have a connected message, by the way, on my screen. Remember when the Sabin came in? These turned on. I'm sending a UA out, and I'm typing, how you doing? I see this on, off, on, off, on, off. This is staying on. So as usual, I call Les on the phone and say, Les, what the heck's going on? He's saying, well, you're not connecting to me. I say, yeah. I'm connected. Well, yeah, the UA, uh, the SABM came in, put me in the connected converse mode, and I typed, how are you doing? And that's sitting here in the buffer, and I'm sending UAs back, but he's not hearing them. So as far as he's concerned, I'm not even on the frequency. As far as I'm concerned, he's rude. He won't answer me. This is a very common thing. So I turn on the monitor, and I see him sending me SABMs. Ah, he's not hearing my UAs. That's the problem. So I call Les up again. <laughs> Les, turn your beam my way. <laughs> this is where all this protocol monitoring really comes in handy so you can see what's going on. Okay? This, because that's a very common complaint. I see this going on all the time. Sab him, sab him, sab him, sab him. What does the error mean about the uh, connect? Uh, that has to do with Amtor and other stuff. This stuff is, is all Amptor and, and, and all that. Yeah. Uh, like regular radio, you can hear, but it doesn't mean that someone can hear you. If right. You, you really get this if you're running an HT, you know, or low power. You know, here's this guy, you know, he's got 100 watts coming at you, and you're going with your little one water. 
<laughs> See, and what'll happen, what'll happen, remember our retry parameter? He'll send a SABM for whatever retry you have, and then he'll send a disconnect, and all of a sudden your lights go out. Say, well, that son of a gun, now he didn't talk to me. He hung up on me. <laughs> well, you know, the retry, he only hit seven times, and uh, he gave up. Any other questions here? So we're getting... Oh, this one? Yeah. Yeah, that's your multi-connect. If that light's on, then you've got more than one channel set up. So in other words, I'm on channel one, and I'm connected to less, and then Dick connects to me on channel zero, that light will turn on to tell you you're in the multi-connect mode. Be careful what channel you type your stuff on. <laughs> or if I, you know, if I uh, set up two connects, like I set up one to, to Dick and then one to Les, and I want to tell Dick, boy, that Les is, uh, he's a real AMer, isn't he? I got to make sure with the multi-light on that I'm on the right channel. Okay. Um, next week, why don't you just flip up the slide here? I think this is the end of it. No, this shows when I'm in the connected mode, but I went from converse to command. So that tells me if I type something, the TNC is going to think it's command. It's not going to go out over the air. Okay, uh, next one. Okay, next week we start with all the fun, good stuff. This is how to, we're going to start answering a lot of the questions you've been asking for the last four or five weeks. Uh, you know, what is a digi? What is a node? What is a K node? What is net ROM? What is the net? How to run all the commands? Uh, why you don't want a digi unless you have to? Uh, you know, when would you want a digi? And, and all these kinds of things. So we're going to get into the fun stuff. What I'm hoping to do is to get into it enough so that the following week, which would be the third, I can have either Dave down here to describe or demonstrate uh, Hostmaster with the CAM or Don W9SL to demonstrate Packet Gold. So I'm hoping we get that far. The third is my 30th wedding anniversary, so I probably shouldn't be here. She's been around ham radio for too many years. As I was telling somebody earlier, when she and I were dating, I was pinned to another gal at the university and she was engaged and we were just kind of dating, you know, plutonically. And I told her one time, never marry a ham because in those days I had dynamotors, you know, I mean, to run mobile in those days on HF was something. And every once in a while she brings that up, should have listened to you. <laughs> so I'm hoping we get to that point where we can have somebody fill in for us because Joe's going to be up skiing or playing or something, so he won't be here. So, <laughs> nice romantic I'll evening. An card. I'll put a candle here. Anybody got a candelabra? A glass of wine? Okay, well, if there's no questions, we'll call if you want to come up here and see what's going on.